standard um, kind of access to to information on on any citizen, uh, you know, uh, that the government may have, um, you know, without a warrant or any kind of uh, thing like that. So these all these in, in systems are now kind of getting becoming more connected. So I, I, think, I don't really have a question so much, but it, you you didn't mention so much about that aspect. So I was just curious how you sort of see that kind of connecting into what you were talking. The, um, well, I guess I do. Um, the, uh, the thing that you remind me of when you were speaking was Stephen, Stephen Ball, um, who works at the University of London, Institute of Education, uh, University yeah, of London. Yeah, yeah. He, wrote this, he, he writes about, I guess he, uh, he wrote Global Education Incorporated in 2010. He writes about um, um, transnational activist networks. Um, as kind of forming geographies of neoliberalism, so we don't, so you don't just see single competing capitalists or single agencies. You get you get ter terrains of kind of, of, I guess, I guess they're a little bit like kind of old. We can extend the kind of old joint stock company metaphor from the kind of 19th century that all of a sudden you've got you've got educational publishers looking to harvest data and working with the suppliers of, of learning management systems, looking to work with. Um, I, I guess corporations like Pearson, or them working working with policymakers as well, in, or, in order to try and create a, a wider terrain. So when you were speaking, I was kind of I, I agree with you that there are that your ability to map individuals and then place them operating across a, a wider a wider terrain operates, I guess, in terms of kind of control in that way, and then coercion. We have issues of coercion. Also, then at a kind of a separate but connected level, in terms of sort of acute accumulation. So, you, so your ability to track an individual student's engagement online with specific stuff, and whether that aligns with whether that aligns with their outcomes, and what services need to be sold into the institution in order to be able to get them to good honours, or to get them a good outcome, or or whatever, or to get them effectively to be able to manage the risk on um, that they will pay back their loan, their fee. Sorry. So yeah, you're right, and it needs more work in in uncovering the networks of individuals and of corporations that are interconnected, and the ways in which those affect our ways in which those affect kids from three right the way through to me, you, whoever, my now. Right, uh, there's somebody over there, yeah. Uh, just, uh, Actually, could people just very, just say their names when they, uh, and if, they, if it's relevant, whether they're part of any organisational network or anything? Yeah, yeah. I'm Pete Wood, I'm actually in SWP. Um, the, the question about the autonomy to, to capitalism, I found it slightly, uh, obviously I haven't, Read the piece. I, I, it, it seemed to me slightly um, too deterministic and disempowering of yeah. the worker class because yeah. uh, it seems that the capital, uh, you know, autonomy of capital, but actually the capitalists cannot exist without us. You know, we produce their stuff, and if we yeah. don't work, they're fucked. Excuse my language. So I think it's, it's important that I think. It seems a little bit like it's slightly loaded. And yeah. uh, to follow on from that, actually, the point about the you know, all-powerful state and state control and so on. If you look now, for example, Grenfell, there are cases now where people are actually who registered, and the government are going to try and deport them. Right? You know, the despicable, racist, horrible nature of this government. They're going to deport people. Who've, who are not uh, who are not registered, right? Mm. Now they can they'll only get away with that if we don't fight, mm. right? So even though the laws and, and all the structures are there and they should be able to take people and deport them, no, they won't just be able to take people and deport them. They'll only do that if we don't fight. So if we fight, we can stop their system. I think that's quite important in relation to this question about uh, you know, the, the autonomous and the sort of almost deterministic nature of their argument. I think that you know, workers, we can stop them. We can, we can by resisting, uh, we can stop their production and also by resisting, even though they have their laws, they have their control, they have all the information, we can still stop or attempt stop their despicable racist policies such as deporting uh, uh, you know, people from Grenfell. Okay, I'm going to take actually a couple, uh, maybe three, uh, and then uh, I'll, uh, um, Richard can reply, so I think you're next, yeah.
Yeah, hi, uh, Nick from Plan C, I guess. Um, uh, it's, it's, I, know one of the, I guess it's a question for both, just to throw it out there. Um, is that, I guess there's two questions around techno politics. You know, that. It's yeah. a circular yeah. one. The first is acceleration, yeah. isn't it? And if you want to beat up on them, that's totally fine by me. That's not actually my question. The second, it's the second thing I'm interested in. Is one of the, the approaches to science and technology, uh, automation in particular, cybernetics, that gets circulated as an analysis of the current uh, conjuncture, like in terms of crisis is I guess what you'd almost call um, for what's been described as a secular process towards the intensification of the proletarianization of work. So the use of technology for de-skilling, automating a series of tasks that were otherwise craft or school labor. So journalism, law, all sorts of stuff. So then one hand is a process of proletarianization. And the other half of that, so you know, the, the nifty sort of capitalism, capitalism consuming itself theory is that at the same time, through automation, algorithms, uh, and cybernetics, you get the expulsion of these newly proletarianized people from the workforce, creating a permanent mass, ever-growing surplus population that, in our fantasies, rises up and Mad Max like smashes people. But there's a there, so you've got acceleration on one side, and the other side you've got secular crisis tendency of capitalism due to a particular technological dynamic. That's bound up in you know the, the race for profits, marginal advantage, uh, smashing any sort of autonomous parallel of course, that sort of stuff. And I just wanted to get a bit of a sense from you both what you thought of that particular narrative, considering how dominant it is, even when implied. Okay. Uh, is it? Is it? Yeah. Is it next? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, oh. The, uh, oh, I, I'm Bob Hughes, uh, and I've brought, I come on home to plug my, my book, which came out the cover last year, about, about technology and inequality and human impact and the, uh, the alternative paths that technology can take. So if you're interested, to take a look. I've got some um, there's a, I've noticed a lot in the dis discussion of, uh, left discussions uh, uh, of phenomenon of the digital economy or whatever, or well, talking about, about cybernetics as if it's a thing that uh, is almost synonymous with the technology, and and that's a weakness I think, because cybernetics, uh, and here we go, is the science of, of of whole systems, which is exactly what capitalism is not. You know, capitalism has to have its externalities. Uh, a cybernetics that was really reclaimed by the left would look at those whole systems and uh, in in. The, the, this age of, of uh, ecological crisis, um, you know, that is really what we've got. What, what we've got to do. Cybernetic isn't some techie thing that capitalists dreamt up. Uh, a lot of the background of, uh, of cybernetics is, 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 uh, is among socialists um, and, 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 and communists and, uh, and, and, and neuroscientists. Um, it, it, it's a big and noble endeavour. Um, the uh, I wanted to I actually just a, a, a little thing, Richard. You um, just just a, a point. You said that Cybersyn started under Fry. I don't think it. Well, I wasn't aware that it that it had done. I think that it was. You know, Stafford Beer was invited yeah, was, was invited yeah. to Chile yeah. by um, you know, by by, by uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah yeah. But it's um, yeah, it's a great it's a great book that one that you, yeah. one that you mentioned by um, Eden Medina. Um, yeah. So anyway, this idea of a cybernetics cybernetic happens to be being this overwhelming horrible force that uh, that somehow we've got to struggle against. Um, which okay, it is it is that's all about power, but it kind of I think it's blind to the way the power operates. This technology can work either way. Um, I, I was thinking, you know, we, we rather lack examples of, of, uh, um, of technology used for the uh, for the people. Of course, the Cybersyn project is, is 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 one such thing. The Lucas plan uh, is another, and there are many uh, such things. But uh, it is very difficult for for us in this brainwashed age 
to see how technology could be any other than it is. So it's rather good to look for examples of the way technology has been used to, to, to increase control of, uh, uh, of, of people by, by, by the capitalist system. And, and uh, actually, what, what, one, one example that sort of just struck me here, I'll shut up, uh, was um, something that, uh, that Ursula has mentioned um, uh, very, very lucidly in a, in, a, in a paper of hers, is about the way that um, uh, like social services, um, sort of bureaucracies, have been uh, tamed by the system. So that even if you've got, well, remember the film, I, Daniel Blake, you know, you have nice people working in, uh, in, the, in the claims offices that they want to help the people who, there are, who want to come. They're not all bastards, but the system simply will not allow them to do it. Once you've got a system in place like that, uh, it, it means that the nicest person in the world can't give the mother her benefit because the system says no. Now, can you, it will be quite easily imagine a system uh, where all those wonderful resources are used to locate housing and food for a person. Someone comes in with a, with a problem and, 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 that the, and the tools are there for the people who really want to help people. And, and, you know, and our social services and health services are full of people who, who, there, who are there because they want to help people. It is, it, 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 that, I think, is a very clear illustration of the way technolo technology has been claimed by, in the name of power by uh, to, 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 it, to cement its own power and could be used is with, I hope I hope you know, we will put a lot of effort into this into envisaging ways it can be used bottom up okay thanks um, I'm gonna let Richard say uh, respond to some of those points and then we'll carry on with some more questions um I think you. I, I agree with you. I don't, I'm not coming from. A, I'm not a, a thesis is not on the cybernetic hypothesis. So I'm, I'm kind of with you. And you maybe you maybe think about Gortz's work on the kind of interrelationship between heteronomy and autonomy, and how do we how do we effectively reduce the sort of ex, the, the external demands that are made upon us by the by the system, whatever it is. What what is the what is the relationship between that and our our own ability to kind of liberate ourselves or to do other things? For me, the one of the interesting things in that moment, and using things like Brenthal, are the ways in which that is not just a, a housing issue, you know. I, and I guess then in that moment, the fact that we want to push back against the um, push back against well, the 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 the, the guy who's running the inquiry, but also the terms of the inquiry, we want to look at all the other kind of wider factors, and that becomes then a terrain, a wider terrain for 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 resisting power or rupturing or doing something different. And fundamentally, it's why. You know, you ain't never going to solve the problems in, I work in higher education, I work on the alternatives to HE. You don't ever solve the problems in, of HE only in HE. They get, they get solved on a wider terrain because you make you have solidarity actions with other people who are being screwed over elsewhere. But I, I think you're right that in the, in the moment of trying to abolish labour, we, we try and, we, we, there's, a, there's a sense of trying to recompose who we are and have the kind of, it's an issue about courage, isn't there, I think, in that moment and, join, and joining up. Which kind of brings me then back to this point here, Bob. Um, just in terms of finding those examples of where things have been done differently, I think. You know, so obviously we're talking about Lucas, and, and we forget our history. So we're talking about Lucas when we're talking about cyber sin and what might be done differently, and the problems in that. Not to fetishise them, but to look at what might be done differently, because there are other examples. You know, Open Data Manchester is a great example of attempt, effectively trying to stitch in service need to, to available services in order to do something different around, I don't know, the provision of, of health care and social care for elderly people, for instance. So we're, we're trying to join up communities of individuals who might be who might be hackers or might be people working on, on sort of information management, might also be people working in social care, might also be people who are carers. So you've got a bigger network upon which you kind of push back. Um, and we need to kind of, we need, I guess there's an issue about surfacing those and an issue about joining those up. But sometimes I don't think we see the kind of that level of work that is being done. We don't, we can't see it for, for whatever reason. And it doesn't need to be surfaced. Um, not really an accelerationist. Um, uh, but I, I didn't mean to imply that. No, 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 I know. I'm aware of the, you know, I'm aware of the, I'm aware of the, um, of the stuff. There's a great guy, um, 
Cor who goes by on Twitter goes by the name of Dam Dam D A M N underscore Jehu J E H U. It's a kind of um, American antsy communist. He's a great guy, you know. Communism is free time and nothing else. But he's done some quite interesting critiques of accelerationism, Nick Land stuff, all of all of that. Really interesting guy. I'm kind of I suppose I'm in, your proletarianization point. Did you make the proletarianization point? It's fundamental because it's happening. I see it in my place. You know, the 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 use of technologies, the instantiation of technologies in order to drive, in order to strip, in order to strip out the kind of labour content from individuals. You know, it might be the might be the recording of the enforced recording of lectures or or teaching sessions, and then and then those effectively forming you, the institution gets ownership of kind of performance rights. It gets it gets ownership of the content itself. You then see things like at Manchester where you get 900 academics being put at risk because they're going to get rid of 170, but they're also going to employ 100 precariously employed early career academics. You know, so you, you can see this cheapening of labour, you can see the kind of uh, almost a sort of extraction of, 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 of labour content into the machine. It, you know, Marx talks about it in, 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 in you know, we become the best of watchmen. Forgive me, the watch person of the of the machine. Um, he, obviously, he talks about the general intellect in that in that moment as well, and the way in which capital takes the skills, capacities, knowledges that we kind of that have been socially produced, and then embeds them within the machine as if it was always capitals. You know, and one of the things I think that is quite interesting coming out of the autonomist <coughs> movement then is to think about that in terms of. I don't know how do we liberate that on a wider social terrain as a form of kind of mass intellectuality that celebrates kind of our work on open data, celebrates alternative ways of doing things, but across a wider social terrain that isn't just about housing or just about education or just about health. It's more than that. But I think surfacing those issues to do with you know what, has, what happens on TaskRabbit when when people are being brutalised or in delivery where they're being brutalised or Uber where they're being brutalised where the, where it's toxic. Surfacing those narratives, I think, is, is fundamental. And I can see I see it happening in little patchworks. So you see it in higher education, people talking about this. There's a job lot of quitlet about people who are or people with mental health issues or anxiety issues that are from those particular workspaces. There's something about attempting to sort of build that into a more of a narrative to resist the idea of finding ways of rupturing those issues around. I haven't got the solution, right, but finding ways of resisting that proletarianization is fundamental, I think. Didn't really answer your point, did I? But, you know, that was the, that, I guess that's where I'm coming from, is to, is to out that and then, and then look on a social terrain about how we resist it and how we might use technology to do that. Okay, did you have your hand? I think you did, didn't you? Okay, so, you know, by the way, um, it's now about five to nine. I'm thinking that we'll continue this question, this question and answer stuff until about half past nine, if people are happy with, with that, and whether we'll stop then and become a lot more informal. Um, so, yeah. Um, could we please have a question from a woman? Um, I was not the only person who um, had my hand but the only woman. I saw other women had their hands up. And uh, Ursula said in the lecture, well, sorry. Well, that's fine if you want to reply to anything. I, I'm, I'm very happy to let the questions go. Don't worry, I have a parent in mind. Yeah, go on. Is that me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I wanted to ask about a very, uh, quite a specific example. Sorry, Sorry I've got I'm a really quiet deaf, voice. I can't hear you. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask specifically about, uh, so, when so all the, this talk about about control and about the um, the kind of this kind of rising tide of kind of precarious work and gig economy, and I wanted to know if either of you have um, or what you think about the stuff that happened in Taiwan particularly. Like I don't know if you if you've been following that the like there's been like a kind of series of legal actions against Uber as an employer and various places have managed to ban Uber from operating and in Taiwan um, there was actually the development of a online software called Pol.Eth which is a artificial intelligence sort of algorithm based software uh, which runs online and enables people to kind of um, do some kind of like participatory democracy 
um, but the people who developed it were actually quite kind of interested in rather than in rather than in the idea of, of consensus as control they're more interested in the ideas of dissensus and um, eventually they through this through this online platform they managed to create a new set of laws in the country which effectively banned uber from operating and um, yeah, I wanted to know if, if either of you had any comments on that in terms of like a, this kind of act of resistance that is coming from the technological side of things rather than, and also relates to that thing of like how people and their bodies relate to technology and like um, using that kind of distributed network of people as a kind of force. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose I, I started from the rage that um, it's a Silicon Valley uh, men who are the richest in the world and they're sitting on a cash mountain and people are so infatuated with digital technologies that they're not pushing um, for governments to get their money, to get their, get their hands on this money. And when I suggested that Apple products should be boycotted, people stopped talking to me because they were so young. Um, but and I think increasingly people are valued by numbers for what they're worth. So this is financial and the evolution. But I also think that this maybe is where we went wrong. If we imagine the industrial revolution, um, where we started to put this tremendous value on mathematics, that mathematics is true. And this was applied to obviously to engineering and things sort of work mostly. Um, but then it was applied to society and also to Marx kind of applied this a very clever man. But I think later sociologists and the subject of sociology and the bundle of economics, they are trying to act like mathematics are true. And I, I mean obviously the 2007 2008 thing is in the economy school like rationally. So I suppose it's really, where can we go with this illusion that mathematics is it, anything other than just mathematics, it's a, it's a game, that it's not living thing, that it's not the world which is infinitely connected, and we can't have this control. The only good reasons of going to Mars, I mean, that would be the one that actually would be the government. Democratically, for example, I'm going. You're going. Um, oh. Sorry. No, so, no, Ursula, no, Ursula, is, Ursula is cool. Okay. Yeah, okay, fine. Well, I've you. chummed it too much. Sorry. Yeah, and I'm really sorry we had to start so late because right. of it. Uh, so, anyway, well, just. Sorry. Quick I'll I'll Thanks very much. Um, I'll, I'll blog some thoughts on those last very cool. important points, okay. particularly about the domination of white, male, you know, sort of male, hetero norms in technology and what that means. And uh, you were dead right. Okay. <laughs> take, take care. Okay, all right. Um, I think you're next, yeah. Yeah, very obvious. Quick answer. One way to tackle problems of people is just to kill them all. <laughs> I suspect this is across a few arch capitalist minds. I'm Robin, and I edit an encyclopedia of deep politics called Wiki Spooks. And I would like to know, I mean, there's a, there's a huge talk about the pressure to control of systems and the view that human beings are part of the system, and I think also the natural world. As a human being, we don't want to be controlled. This is a real <coughs> contradiction of this ideology. And I'd like to hear any thought about the use of terror as a means to try to get control of people. Okay, that's a big question. Um, I'm gonna, that's been three questions, so um, I'll give Ursula a chance, and then you're next, Gail. Um, so, go on. Uh, right, well, uh, an awful lot of issues have been raised. I'm not quite sure what to start. This issue of, of proletari uh, proletarianization and preparization is obviously huge. <coughs> and I think, um, I, I, um, I, I uh, an idea that's around an awful lot right now is this idea of, of a generalised kind of precariat or a multitude and so on. I do want to take issue with that. I found it a very unhelpful 
concept in, in all sorts of ways, which I won't go into in detail. But mainly because um, uh, I think precarization is kind of, it's, and casualization is kind of, it's a useful verb. <laughs> but the people who are made precarious are not passive people who remain in that state without resisting and fighting about and doing something about it. They're absolutely not. And you might as well talk about like a hunger terrier, to the hungry or the homeless, and yeah. construct a class out of them. You know, um, yes, you know, precariousness is, is, is a consequence of the relative power of capital in relation to labour and, and cause ever thus. And, and I think historically the most interesting thing that has to be explained is how in the third quarter of the 20th century, during what more or less coincided with the Cold War period, how such a large portion of the workforce in the developed economies actually managed to negotiate for itself a relative state of imprecariousness, of, you know, relative job security. It never applied to the whole workforce, but, you know, for a privileged minority, there was a period of a good getting on the 30 years, when, you know, the, the, the job for life with a fixed working week for pension and so on, was, was something approaching a norm, and it was an aspirational norm, even if not an actual norm. And I think it's, you know, I, I don't want to go into details about why I think that happened at that point in history. But, so, precar but precariousness is not a permanent state. So today's precarious workers are tomorrow's organised workers just as many of today's organized workers are tomorrow's unemployed workers, because they're the ones that the capitalists really take on in the most vicious and, and brutal way. Um, and, and so it's a person, we can see it all around us now to come back to your question. Delivery workers are organizing, Uber drivers are, are, are organizing. They, they, it's easier for them to organize because they hang out together on the street and meet each other. For task rabbit workers, um, mybuilder.com workers, and uh, Bisbee, and, and so on, all these other platforms where workers are in isolation in other people's homes, they don't get to meet each other and it's much, much harder. Um, but they, they're clearly organized. And the whole issue of employment stages for casual workers has been put on the agenda in the last three months, like never before, partly as a result of these workers organising, and also workers on zero hours contracts and other kinds of casualised workers. They're absolutely on, on the march at the moment, not just in the UK, but in other countries. So, so, to, so let's not call them a precariat. Let's see them as, as workers with subjectivity and intelligence and the skills to organize and, and negotiate them and so on. So, um, so that's one part of it. But um, there's a sort of deeper, to, to go back to your earlier question a bit about the nuts and bolts of how all this works and how, how we came this state of affairs of, 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 of the dominance of the global dominance of neoliberalism and, uh, and, and uh, the globalization of capital with terribly little real resistance from workers. How did this come about? And I think we have to see it, the process as, as a, a, a sort of series of incremental steps, really. That how, uh, how uh, once tasks are simplified. It's, it's in the interest of capital to simplify tasks, but in order to simplify them, you need a group of workers who are, who are actually quite bright and intelligent and understand what's going on to, to do the simplifying of other people's tasks and to manage it. And so it's, it's not a, a unitary process, it's a contradictory process. But as, the, the more the task becomes simplified, uh, the more workers become interchangeable and the more the task can be broken down so they can be outsourced. You don't have to stand over workers to make sure they're working in real time anymore because you can pay them by results, you can measure the results. So it can, the work can be outsourced, it can be offshored, it can be moved around. The more standardized it is, the more like Lego bricks it becomes. And workers become more and more interchangeable, uh, contractually, spatially, etc., etc. And the, the part of the great project of neoliberalism I don't want to attribute agency to it, I'm, I'm talking about a short time ago now, was to create the preconditions for that interchangeability of work. Standardization is absolutely the root of it. And look how the dock workers have destroyed it. The um, introduction of the standard shipping container, 
was absolutely critical in casualising uh, uh, or, pro, you know, breaking the power of logistics workers. It, inter interestingly enough, in 1960, it was the year that Peter Seeger's Little Boxes record came out. It was the year they agreed on the international standard for the shipping container. Um, since then, there have been loads and loads and loads of other international standards, whether it's for Microsoft qualifications or uh, so you can fly a plane into Hanoi and you see on the roofs of the factories, ISO, whatever number, showing that the, the, the work in that factory conforms to an international standard. So this standardization has spread across all sectors and industries with the connivance of bodies like the World Trade Organization and the International Standards Organization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that, uh, the impact of that on organized labor in developed countries, people often talk about it as like a quantitative impact. They say, oh, X number of jobs have gone to China or whatever. It, it's a qualitative impact. The existence of the Global Reserve Army of Labor is used to discipline labor in the developed economies. They don't want to put all the call center jobs in India. Uh, put a few of the call center jobs in India, and you signal to all the call center workers in the UK that their jobs might be next. So that you know disciplines them, but uh, but it's not absolutely not in capital's interest to to have mass unemployment. So yes. uh, sorry, yes. yeah. Yeah, if I was going to turn that to the sort of do the Harry Cleaver glasses, you're basically saying it's not machines to be resisted, but measure. So the position of measure that creates the standards that then create the capacity to the I'm not quite saying that. I'm saying that the standardization is the underpinning of the global division of labor. And I mean, it also enables it to be management because standardization goes hand in hand with quantification. Quantification goes hand in hand with collecting standard performance measures, which are then used to discipline workers. And what is particularly insidious right now, going back to this gig economy thing, is that the performance measures are not just how quickly you did that particular task in that particular place, you know, measured by GPS, measured by real time on the phone or whatever it is, but also the, the other aspect of the discipline is the user rating. And this use of the user rating to discipline workers, it sets the working class against itself. It, it means that one group of workers is involved in the disciplining of other group of workers, with the, the system being able to claim, oh, nothing to do with me, you know, we're just following the algorithms. And it seems to me that that is absolutely to be resisted. And you see it, you don't just see it in task rabbit workers, in Uber drivers, you will see it in universities, you know, all these student surveys, it's all you see it in the health service, you know, where it's, where it's a precondition for privatization very often. But this use of user ratings, and the way people internalize, they anticipate the user rating. They, they don't dare say no. We were interviewed, I think, a couple of weeks ago, a task rabbit worker who'd been, had to carry eight plastic bags full of broken glass down a dark concrete stairwell. And they said, well, she was cut all over. Of course she was, you know. And they said, well, why didn't you say no? Well, you know, I would have got a bad user rating. I didn't dare. And so we're all living under that regime. Dad, yeah. shut up there. I'm going on to me. Sorry. <laughs> all right. I'm just going to take uh, uh, a moment to kind of step into Bob's shoes, as it were, and kind of make a comment on one of the two of the remarks that have been made about the use of other ways in which we can use uh, technology in our own interest, you know, uh, practical example, you know, uh, and uh, yeah, to really the Manchester Open Data thing, and um, uh, those are all kind of, um, on the one hand, on the short term, they are, uh, you know, apparently sensible and practical ways of uh, using technology to serve useful interests. Um, from the point of view of the kind of ideas and the cybernetic hypothesis, I think they would say that one of the distinctive things about this uh, idea of cybernetics and of, a, of a, a system which constantly feeds back in order to stabilise itself is that there's a sense in there's a sense in which 
that kind of uh, that kind of use of technology actually um, entrenches the overall uh, system of you know based based on the, based on these technologies. It provides information to the system to correct itself, uh, and so there's there's a real sense in which um, uh, I think the writers of the cybernetic hypothesis would say that a lot of conventional resistance and a lot of our kind of well-meaning uh, uses of technology can actually, uh, in, in some kind of insidious way, actually end up reinforcing the system. And that doesn't mean to say, oh, we mustn't think of doing these things. But I think we need to be aware of that when we, uh, you know, when we try out these new ideas. And the world is full of brilliant ideas of how we can use digital technologies for uh, progressive purposes. But uh, yeah, we have to be a bit careful about that. Okay, uh, go. Um, <laughs> So many different things have come up that, you know, um, all right, um, well, I'm, um, I'm a member of the Breaking the Frame Working Group and I'm a member of the Feminist Library and I have a uh, small but perfectly cool book that I would like to send you, which includes some poems about all of this, including one which is entitled Off Your Computers and Onto the Streets. Um, which I think sort of summarises some of my position. And by the way, you can get a badge which says that over there. Yes. Um, and um, I think it's a, it's really a pity that that uh, I mean it's a pity that Richard's gone altogether. But um, I I really wanted to respond to one point that he made about um, he didn't understand why somehow all of these different little pockets of radical activity had become invisible to each other. And my answer to that is, it's an over-dependence on digital technology. Um, and that actually, um, I'm sorry to say this, but in the good old days, you know, we relied on newsletters, we relied on telephone trees, we relied on human communications and therefore it was actually in fact much easier to find out what was going on certainly in your own locality if not uh, well even nationally you know um, if you wanted to find out you know we used to back in the good old days we used to have um, campaigning meetings of national campaigns and people would actually come from you know, 20 or 30 different towns and cities to these meetings. Um, so, um, I mean, I'm with Jane on this. I think it would be an awful, you know, I speak with a smartphone in my pocket, I confess, we all have our internal inconsistencies. Um, but um, I think, you know, we should, it would be a really good start if we did resist um, doing, you know, using the technology and be very, very critical of, of the ways that we use it. Um, and um, I just wanted to come back to this thing that you were saying about the precaria, which is that, um, I mean, I don't want to quibble about terminology, right? But I think that one of the reasons why I find it quite a useful <coughs> term in certain respects is because it makes it very clear that um, there are people, people who had what you might have called stable middle class jobs. Their employment situation has become very precarious. And uh, I mean, my, my main experience is in the publishing industry. Um, and we saw this happening very early on when um, you know, editors who worked for companies and had, uh, you know, a, a skilled job. Um, this was before, like, de-skilling in, in one sense came in. But, you know, they were forced to go freelance um, and they became very precariously employed um, because they had to um, buy their own computers, pay for that equipment and work at home. Um, and that, that tendency is only 
you know, increase them. I think, and this is in an, an area which was traditionally fairly highly unionised. Um, so, so I think maybe it's a, like you say, it's a kind of transitory state. But I think it it is a state of of being that people need to be conscious of, of what you know what is actually happening to them. Um, and sorry, just one other really quick point, which is. Um, about the, um, the the university um, and how it is being used as a as a means of social control, and also around the whole issue of immigration and how uh, staff are unable to um, to resist the fear of losing their jobs, um, and that staff are being forced to take registers. Um, I don't know any of you who work in universities. Um, but I'm sort of confident recently where this was being discussed. Um, and apparently there was a conference that was organised, which was called Resist the Internal Borders, which was around a lot of this stuff. Um, and and it's, it's really scary in a way that a lot of these, uh, you know, people who work in, in industries where they want to do caring work are being, you know, forced to actually do stuff that is totally against their best interest, partly because they want to keep their jobs, and you know it's just ghastly. I don't know what to say. Okay, thanks, and I'll just say, um, and that is a great example that, that that last example you've given of what they talk about in cybernetic hypothesis about this insistence upon uh, transparency. Uh, the, one of the principles of the cybernetic system is transparency, i.e., give us your data, basically. Uh, it was interesting that was written before uh, social media came about, but social media is a complete, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, complete, uh, perfect example of, 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 of that transparency that it, it, be it becomes uh, an insistence uh, uh, upon all of the socially defined norm that we should be open. And that's why they're quite, they, you know, he, read out of, you know, we want less transparency, we'd like some opacity, thank you. Um, yeah, it's kind of better. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, so, my name's Simon Pirani, uh, I think meetings like this are great and we should have more of them, physically actually sitting talking to each other. Um, and uh, I, I suppose my question uh, to you, Ursula, is you, you talked about, uh, in, in terms of a sort of analytical framework, okay, so um, I, I I feel that I don't yet have an analytical framework which works for me as somebody who believes in radical social change and I'm not the only one. I mean, I think we, we lack, uh, maybe somebody's got one, but uh, uh, you, you, you stress that technology was for, uh, used to control the work process, uh, for surveillance, uh, for simplifying the work process in the way that you, 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 you described to us, and uh, also uh, for creating new commodities. And, so then to give an example that I understand, because a lot of things about digital technology and the internet I don't understand, but to give an example that I, that I do understand, uh, you mentioned uh, the effect of electrical appliances in people's homes on domestic labor. And uh, I, I've been researching this a little bit, and the three things, once people have gas and electric, that they get in rich countries, uh, or they got mostly in the past tense, is a gas cooker, a fridge, and a washing machine. Those are the three first things. Then all the rest of the stuff uh, starts to come in. Now, I, I mean, I, I suppose my question is, I mean, is it not the case that we need a framework where we see technology as something of a double-edged sword in the way that uh, our friend over here, is it Bob, Bob, sorry, Bob, yeah. Bob uh, mentioned, in order to understand, because yes, on the one hand, there's a commodification aspect to that, because that fridge is filled with food that then, you know, it's about the move away from the countryside to towns and away from people having plots where they grow stuff and or they buy, you know, local stuff and it's about them buying it from the supermarket and putting it in the fridge. On the other hand, that really helps to diminish a certain aspect of domestic labor. Then the, in rich countries, uh, the domestic workers, the women, housewives, got cars, which is another kind of stage of this whole pro So, I mean, all I want to say is, to my mind, it's very complicated. Yes, there's a commodification, but there's also, uh, I mean, all the research shows that in rich countries, um, the hours of work, counterintuitively, 
uh, of domestic labour, of housewives, and I'm sure you know, have not decreased over the last century because new things are found, new types of burdens are created to put on. To, to, yeah, we've got to be cleaner, the kids have got to be, you know, taken here, there, and everywhere. There's got to be, you know, all this new work is, is created. Um, and also, I mean, this research it shows that, it, you know, that people stop having domestic servants, men do even less. Uh, all that, all that is going on, um, but uh, but nevertheless, I mean, women in rich countries now do not do the sort of backbreaking physical labour that women in poor countries do. They don't generally. No, because they have women from poor countries who come and do it for them. Well, class well no, they have. To, uh, yeah, yes, but they also have washing machines and refrigerators and and, and gas cookers. So uh, that's why I want to argue for the devil edged ness. And what I want to say about the internet is that. And, other people can provide examples. There's also a double-edged so, so mess there. Sent. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and the last point is somebody mentioned accelerationism. I mean, uh, you know. I, so my question to you is: Do we have a really convincing answer, both to the sort of accelerationists who call themselves that, and to sort of Paul Mason, who basically, you know, in his book, which has been read, you know, very widely about this this stuff, and he writes very well, and he's seen as part of the left and so on, in the end it's about new technology is paving the way to post-capitalism. And I think there's a kind of, there's a, the, 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 there's a monstrous sort of ideological trick that's being played. If you go back to Castells, which he relies on very heavily, it's also there. Um, and that, 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 that trick has to be worked on. So, uh, if somebody needs to work on, My name is Ross.